All right, everybody. Um, so I think we'll we'll get started. Um, just for the for the secondary audience that might you know watch this online later, I'll, I'll give a, a bit of an introduction. Um, uh, so my name is uh, Desiree O'Hara. I'm the director of the Internet Study Center uh, at Western Washington University. Um, uh, the, um, the Internet Study Center is focused on the interdisciplinary study and design of digital technologies, and the lecture series that, that we've been organizing presents leading scholars and practitioners whose work challenges and extends our understanding of digital technology and its place in the world. Um, a bit about our speaker today, uh, Miriam Reddy is a research manager at MediaWiki Foundation and a, a visiting research fellow at King's College London. Uh, formerly, uh, she worked as a research scientist at Yahoo Labs in uh, Barcelona and Nokia Bell Labs in Cambridge. Um, her, she has a PhD from Euricom and her research is focused on social multimedia computing, working on fair, uh, interpretable, multimodal machine learning solutions to improve knowledge equity. Um, so with that, uh, I'm, I'm super pleased to welcome Miriam. Thank you for joining us today. Um, you should be able to share your slides if you like. Yes, yes, yes. Um, now you should be able to see it. So uh, let me put it full screen. If I don't hear anything, I'm assuming you're seeing my screen, although it can take a while to load this presentation. I don't know why it, it was working fine enough to. OK, now this is working. All right. Uh, Dustin, I'll go ahead then. Yeah, please. Okay. All right. All right. So good afternoon, I guess, everyone. Uh, my name is Miriam, and I am extremely happy to be here. I am based in London, so it's uh, 10 PM for me. I just had some chocolate to give me the energy to uh, give you this presentation. I am uh, super happy to share some of the research that we do at the Wikimedia Foundation towards something that we call knowledge equity and we will see what this is about. So let's dive into it. You might not have heard about Wikimedia Foundation or a research team, but I am pretty sure you've heard about Wikipedia. Wikipedia is the largest online encyclopedia that anyone can edit and access for free. And you might also know that as we speak, Wikipedia is evolving. There are hundreds and of thousands of uh, volunteers, uh, editors around the world that ed edit, create, uh, uh, change, improve the content, the beautiful content that you see every day on Wikipedia at, at a pretty steady pace. And so the result of, of this um, evolution is, uh, is uh, quite remarkable. So as of today, Wikipedia is the largest uh, encyclopedia online. Um, with about 52 million articles spanning more than 300 languages. Um, and then, as I said, the pace at which it changes is pretty huge. And every month, Wikipedia gets edited about 10 million times. And this content is widely uh, explored. Um, every month, to, we get about 15 billion page views coming from to our site. To our site. So um, about 15 million times the content is visited. Billion, not million, billion. And these are already pretty big numbers, uh, but if you think about it, the audiences of Wikipedia content are not necessarily only the people who read uh, directly the content on Wikipedia. Um, search engines and uh, Home assistants are reusing uh, a lot of the content that is on Wikipedia and repurpose it for their customers. So uh, this reuse of Wikipedia content actually um, in, in, uh, enlarges the number of the eventual consumer of the content that uh, these volunteers create every day. So these are pretty big numbers. Um, and so you might be curious, apart from the hundred thousand of people who create the content every day, who operates Wikipedia, who is behind all that. And this is where we 
come into the picture, Wikimedia Foundation. Wikimedia Foundation is a non-for-profit organization with about 500 um, employed staff. And what we do is that we don't create or modify content. This is entirely done by volunteers, but we provide support to the communities of volunteers that, that create this content. So. Uh, we provide technical support, um, legal support, communication support, uh, fundraising, and also innovation support. And that is why there's a, there exists a research team at the Wikimedia Foundation that um, whose mission is basically to design technologies and do fundamental research that can support uh, free knowledge communities um, and in, help them improve the content on Wikimedia uh, projects. So this is us, we are uh, just eight people. There's Leila who's the head of research and a bunch of research scientists um, and uh, the research engineers in the research community office. Um, as you can imagine, we are only eight people and the numbers we've seen before are, are pretty huge. So there are quite some fundamental research questions that we have to deal with. And eight people is, is not necessarily a lot. So we really rely a lot on many formal collaborators from academic institutions from all around the world that really help us uh, answering longer term uh, research questions. And at the same time, they multiply our research capacity so we can actually um, deliver um, better uh, research more um, efficiently. And so this is us, but what do, you, do we do? So um, we work on three main research direction. Um, the first one is the one that we will see today, that is about addressing knowledge gaps. Addressing knowledge gaps means doing research that can help us bringing uh, the, all the content that is not on Wikipedia, on Wikipedia, and making sure that everyone who wants to access or edit Wikipedia could access or edit Wikipedia. The second one is about improving knowledge integrity. And this is really about doing research that can help preserve the integrity and the reliability of the content um, on, on Wikimedia projects. And the third one is about nurturing the research community. As, as a research team at the Wikimedia Foundation, we're a kind of central hub for all those researchers across different disciplines that are interested in uh, investigating Wikimedia communities or improving the content on sites or doing any sort of research around Wikimedia. So we provide um, a data, tools, infrastructure, and also um, events where, where the researchers can gather. And all these research directions are very beautiful and I would like to have five hours to tell you about all, all of this. But for the interest of time, I'm going to focus on the first one, which is addressing knowledge gaps. <clears throat> and so to tell you about um, our research in addressing knowledge gap, I'm going to start with a fundamental principle that is really at the core of everything we do. This is one of the two strategic principles of the strategy of the movement of the Wikimedia movement as a whole. So uh, volunteers, the Wikimedia Foundation, everyone who's interested in, in Wikimedia projects. Knowledge equity is that principle that is encouraging us to include into Wikimedia projects those knowledge and communities that have been left out by structures of power and privilege. And that is encouraging us to build technologies that can break down the social, political and technical barriers preventing people from accessing and contributing to free knowledge. So basically knowledge equity means that everyone in the world should be able to access the content that they need for free. <laughs> and so our contribution as researchers towards this goal is to provide data that can help us collectively understand how far we are from reaching knowledge equity and also build tools and technologies that can help us and uh, the Wikimedia communities get to a point where we can say we've reached knowledge equity. Now, um, the first step towards this goal is to understand knowledge equity. Knowledge equity is, is a very, very complex notion. Um, and so as researchers, what we like to do is to decompose the 
big problem into smaller component that could be easily studied or understood or measured. And so um, instead of uh, we, we operationalize the notion of knowledge equity into these atomic components that are knowledge gaps that are essentially inequalities um, that prevent us from reaching knowledge equity. And so just to give you an example of a, a, a knowledge gap so that, that we have a concrete example, we'll tell you about the most famous, not for good reasons, um, examples of knowledge gaps in Wikimedia projects, the gender gap. The gender gap is a disparity of representation of content or, or, or um, people um, of different gender groups. So for example, we know that 80% of biographies on Wikipedia are about men, but now thanks to recent research, we also know that um, about 75% of the page views that come to our site come from people who self-identify as men. So the gender gap is, is, is pretty huge and it's very, very important to keep studying it. There's been a lot of research already um, uh, around the gender gap. But similar to the inequality of the gender gap, we might have many more of such <clears throat> knowledge gaps of such inequalities that prevent us from reaching knowledge equity. And so what we do as part of this research direction is to collectively study the concept of knowledge gaps and individually um, defining, measuring and bridging each of these knowledge gaps. So the research direction of addressing knowledge gaps has three main uh, themes. The first one is about identifying knowledge gaps. So really understanding what are these individual inequalities that are on Wikimedia projects. The second one is about measuring knowledge gaps. So provide quantifiable evidence that can tell us the extent to which these gaps are present in Wikimedia projects. And the third one is about bridging knowledge gaps. And we will see a bit more of that today. Um, and it's about providing fundamental research and tools that can help us reduce this gap, for example, reduce the gender gap. So I'm gonna concentrate more on the last part on the bridging knowledge gaps, but I'm going to give you some example of the work that we're doing in each of these teams. So let me start with the first one, identify knowledge gaps. The Wikimedia ecosystem is huge. And um, if we want to start a research direction that whose aim is bridging knowledge gap, we first need to have a systematic definition of what are the knowledge gaps in Wikimedia projects. So to do that, we started by identifying the root dimensions of the composition of the Wikimedia movement, the content that we read every day on Wikipedia and its sister project, the readers who read the content and the contributors who create the content. So content readers and contributors are the core dimension um, out of which where we could find potential knowledge gaps. And then once we identify these core dimensions, we did a large um, qualitative analysis of more than 200 references among academic uh, papers, uh, surveys, community initiatives, uh, looking for evidence of inequalities across Wikimedia projects. And then we compile this taxonomy of knowledge gaps that is a structured list of all possible knowledge gaps that we can find in Wikimedia projects. So you have the gender gap there, but you have the geography gap, the uh, technical skill gap, uh, the multimedia gap. There are many of such inequalities that we could find. And actually what you see here is a visually very compact, compact visualization of a 40 plus uh, pages paper that you are absolutely welcome to read. Um, it's an archive. And um, if it, it, I, I, again, this is something that I could talk about for hours, but in the interest of time, I leave you with this link. I can post it later in the chat. And I'm gonna tell, tell you something about step two. So in step one, we identified systematically what are the knowledge gaps in Wikimedia projects. In step two, we want to quantify these gaps. So basically we want to map each of the gaps in the taxonomy into a set of numbers that expose the extent to which the gap exists. For example, 80% of biographies are about men. This is a, a metric to measure the gender gap in content. And so, um, um, 
behind this uh, defining metrics for uh, knowledge gaps, there is a lot of statistics, obviously, a lot of data analysis, but also in some cases, we need to build models and, and do lots of research. Let me give you some example uh, of the output that we can get through this research. So if we have a way to um, automatically associate an article with it, the, a geographic location based on what the article is talking about, then we can measure the geographic gap. And we can see that on English Wikipedia, the vast majority of the articles are about the global north, while only a small portion is about the global south. Another interesting gap that we can explore is what we call the cultural background gap. Here, we want to measure the extent to which uh, Wikipedia edition, say Italian Wikipedia, actually um, uh, its content co covers the local territories where the language is spoken. So for example, for Italian Wikipedia it will be Italy and a, a piece of Switzerland. So what we did here is that we built a classifier that given an article can automatically tell where the, the article is about one of the local territories where the language of the article is spoken. And then we can aggregate this data across all article and we can understand across different languages what is the proportion of coverage of uh, local content. And we see that this proportion varies across all across different languages. And um, so th these numbers are important for us to see some variations, but actually why are why these are really these numbers are really important. It's not for us to say this is good or this is bad. This is really for the communities, the communities of, of um, Wikimedia, in the individual Wikipedias, to um, understand the space of knowledge gaps and track, uh, monitor the progress towards their targets. For example, if Italian Wikipedia says by 2030, we want to 35% of biographies to be about women, by providing these numbers, these measurements, we're able to help them track the progress towards this goal. And actually our end goal and what we're building right now is what we call a knowledge gap index tool that can collect all these metrics and that can help different users navigate across the extent of these gaps across um, the different dimensions. Um, it's not ready yet, but yeah, we're working on that. Uh, the other thing that I, I, I always like to stress is that such a tool and such measurements, they're not only useful for Wikimedia communities. Every researcher who's using Wikipedia data to do, to do an investigation, to train a, a natural language processing model, and now lately also to train computer vision model, they must know that the data that they use is biased um, in a way that my bias the end product of, of um, the model built on the data, right? So knowing the extent to which these bias, these gaps exist, can be also useful for researchers who want to um, understand uh, that impact the, uh, on the end, on the downstream tool, let's say that they're training on, on the data. And um, so the knowledge gap index is coming up. But um, what we're working a lot in these days uh, on is step three about bridging knowledge gaps. Um, I'm just checking the time. I think I still have about 25 minutes, something yet. Um, so bridging knowledge gaps, or 20 minutes. Um, bridging knowledge gaps is, um, comes obviously, so we've been, um, identifying individual knowledge gaps. We've been quantifying individual knowledge gaps. The third step is to really build those tools and interventions that can help us reduce those knowledge gaps. And so these umbrella of bridge new knowledge gaps initiatives uh, um, includes a, a set of different um, research works that go from fundamental um, research about reader behavior to large scale data analysis, machine learning tool, recommender system uh, that can produce insight and framework that down the line can help us, the community and the Wikimedia Foundation bridge knowledge gaps. 
So before I tell you a bit more about uh, how we're doing research on bridging knowledge gaps across readers, contributors, and content, I want to just make a note of one of the principles that uh, really um, is informing a lot of the, uh, the, the technologies that we develop. So when we think about bridging knowledge gaps, we think about addressing gaps starting from the core technologies that we develop. So when we develop, for example, machine learning model, natural language processing model, we try to be as inclusive as possible. Historically, um, models such as topic models have been developed for English languages only. When we think about these kind of models that should be available for um, 300 language editions, we try to reason by default in a language agnostic way so that down the line we are able to uh, basically serve many communities uh, with the same technology. Um, this is a principle, then we will see that some of the research that we do is on English Wikipedia only, So, but this is what we aim to do all the time. So um, let me tell you a bit about um, our research initiatives towards bridging knowledge gaps. I'm going to talk about the three dimensions that we've uh, seen before readers, research about co content, and research about contributors. So let's talk about readers. Um, our role as researchers when we think about bridging knowledge gap in readership is really about understanding the space of readership, understanding how readers behave on the site, what they like, uh, what what is their landscape? What do they like to do? Why they come to our site? So it's really fundamental research that can then down the line inform initiatives that can help bridging knowledge gaps in readers. So we've done some past research about understanding readers' demographics, for example. We've done lots of, uh, we've seen the gen gender gap, but we've done studies on education versus age versus um, other demographic. Uh, traits. We've done lots of research about motivation. There is a famous paper called Why We Read Wikipedia that analyzes the reasons why uh, people come to our site um, and their information need. And a relatively new stream of research is about understanding what we do when we navigate through Wikipedia, what readers do um, when they interact with the content in Wikipedia articles. And there are three main um, areas of interest here um, about readers' interaction with the page. One is about generic navigation patterns and really understand what are the typical ways in which we explore the Wikipedia site. The second one, and this is relatively new, our colleagues have been working quite intensively in a few months and you will see more and more papers coming out. Um, the second one is about citation. Um, why citations? Citations, as you might know, are a, a core core component of our um, encyclopedia um, because essentially most of the information that is on the encyclopedia should uh, exist in the sources cited in the text. Um, so citations are the core component for the reliability on the encyclopedia and understanding how readers interact with citation is important to understand the extent to which they verify the information. Um, and the third stream of uh, research is about images. And since uh, my background is in computer vision, um, I am a big fan of uh, any image studies. So you're stuck with me and we're gonna talk about, among all these, we're gonna talk about image studies. Also because this is relatively recent. So uh, this is really fresh research, hot off the press. So um, this is what, what we're gonna talk about. Um, how readers interact with images on Wikipedia. This is actually um, a part of a bigger line of research that is understanding the role of images on free knowledge ecosystem and especially Wikipedia. The reason for that is that lots of our audiences are very young and we've seen from recent research that young audiences are very, um, it, for young audiences, uh, the, the presence of visual content when they consume knowledge is extremely important. And then in general images are a, are a very powerful tool to 
communicate and, and share knowledge. So the presence of images in an encyclopedia has uh, a role and we want to investigate that. We don't know anything about that. So we're, there are lots of studies that we're doing on this direction. The first one is about understanding how readers interact with images when, read, when they read Wikipedia. Basically understanding when we, when we read the page, we can interact with the images by clicking on them and understanding the extent to which it, this type of engagement is, is happening. So um, how do we do it with this research? We collect data from English Wikipedia only. So already this is a problem that we should replicate this study for many more Wikipedias. So we collected the uh, traffic data, four weeks of traffic data from March, 2021. Uh, the result of this data collection is quite a large data set of about 7 billion page views and 460 million image views. Image views are just the uh, click uh, the events that record the clicks on images. At the time when we collected this data, Wikipedia had around 5 million unique images, out of which we extracted um, a bunch of features that could help us um, make our analysis more granular. So we run these images through computer vision detectors to detect presence of faces, um, the um, indoor outdoor setting, and also we built a special image quality model that can automatically tell the visual quality of the image. And then we extract a bunch of contextual information about the page, um, the, the information about the page where the image is placed, for example, the topic of the page, the caption um, length, the page length, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So what do we find? find? Uh, the first question was about do readers engage with images when reading Wikipedia? And the answer is yes, and a lot. So about one out of 30 times we visit a Wikipedia page, we also click on an image. And if this seems low to you, this is really a lot higher than the type of engagement that we have with other interactive parts of the page. So only one out of 110 times we visit a page, we also click on a link, and this is very low, only one out of 350 times we click on a page, we also click on a citation, which has certain implications. So images are extremely popular compared to other parts uh, and interactive parts um, of the page. And the second question, once we've seen that images are very popular, is um, what are the say, most popular images in terms of uh, readers interaction? And what we found is that um, we like to interact with images that are about complex objects. So anything that relates to art or vehicle or any image that contain a complex object. And the fact that complex images tend to elicit more interest is in line with a bunch of research, not only in experimental psychology, but also in um, what we call computational interestingness. So computational studies about uh, visual interestingness. So it's nice to see that, that this builds on top of that research. We found that people are interested in visiting the world's two images. So anything about map or landmarks, monuments from all around the world tend to elicit a lot of interest from readers. And the third uh, finding, and it's probably the most interesting one, if you're a geek of um, visual studies for web users like me, is about faces. So um, pretty much all the literature that we found about how uh, readers or uh, web users visually interact with visual components on the web found that faces engage us, that we tend to be much more attracted to faces than other components. And what we found is that on Wikipedia, this is not the case. So faces tend to be uh, not among the most um, uh, engaging items on um, uh, uh, Wikipedia pages, unless uh, these faces are from, from people, from biographies that are less popular than others. So uh, faces of popular people, they're not necessarily engaging for Wikipedia users, while in uh, less popular biographies, we see a lot of interactions with images. Um, so this was a surprising finding that basically for these kind of, uh, types of visual interaction, Wikipedia serves a different purpose. And the fourth, fourth finding is about uh, the quality of the page. 
So what we found is that um, we tend to engage with images much more when the quality of the article is lower. So when the page is, is shorter. And it's because obviously if the article is not satisfying, the text of the article is not satisfying our information need, then we need to investigate further on um, other types, you know, other types of content, in this case, uh, visual content. But this relationship between um, non-textual content and um, article quality is something that we found in other types of research. For example, when we look at the engagement with citations and external links on Wikipedia pages, we found that this is much, much higher for pages that are of lower quality. Again, for the same reason, because the text doesn't satisfy the information need. And then recent research um, uh, about reader navigation also found that quality plays a role in, in the browsing patterns on the encyclopedia. And that basically the navigation tend to stop when readers le reach lower quality pages because there's no information there. So again, they need to find it somewhere else. So the fact that quality has such an important um, impact on reader behavior is just one of the findings of this readership research. And um, we just scratched the surface. There is much more of this research research that we want to do in order to understand eventually down the line how we can bring more uh, readers um, on, on the site and more, more diverse readers. Now, speaking about content quality, let's move to bridging content gaps. So uh, we've seen that content quality has an impact on readers. And uh, actually, a lot of the initiatives that we have been putting together to um, bridge knowledge gaps in content were about um, overall helping editors improve the quality of the content at a high level. We're about improving the quality of the content on Wikipedia and its sister projects. Before I tell you about these initiatives, I just want to um, share another principle that is informing the research that we do, especially on the uh, bridging content gap fronts. So if you think about the research team, most of us come from machine learning background. I come from computer vision. We have people from natural language processing graphs, et cetera. And so it is, you know, with, an, with the scale of Wikipedia, it would be, um, interesting to see how actually, you know, you, you could build a, a system that can automatically correct Wikipedia or that can place images on Wikipedia or that can uh, automatically generate summaries to put at the top of the page and things like that. We don't necessarily work in this way. Wikipedia is exists thanks to a community of volunteers with that um, create a content every day following um, uh, certain dynamics, certain community practice that we don't want to disrupt through automated systems. So here, when we think about developing models to bridge content gap, we really think about models that, that can be part of the community and that instead of substituting editors can be of support and can help them reduce, for example, the space of search or do some tasks uh, in an easier way, but in harmony with the community practices. And so typically how we work is a follow, as follows, sorry, I'm, it's a, almost 11, I'm losing the words. So um, we find a problem, the community finds a problem of uh, content missing um, in a project or lower quality um, content in a project. We build a model that can solve this problem. Um, generally an automated model based on machine learning that can help finding the content that is missing or fixing the content that is not good. And then we take this model and we use it to power a tool that and then editor use to uh, fix the original problem. Rather than overwriting what is already there, we are going to work um, in, so the machine is going to work in harmony with the community to help them solve the problem maybe in a faster way, but without disrupting the workflows. So let me give you a couple of examples. Maybe I can squeeze in three, let me see. First problem, 
many articles are missing links, blue links that point to other page, uh, pages on Wikipedia. And this is a problem because uh, it creates navigation problems, but also it's, it's, it's just more difficult to find the content and, and to navigate in, in the site and, and to uh, retrieve the content that, that, that people are looking for. So many articles are missing link. And so we build a link recommendation model. We build a model that given uh, a natural text is going to identify uh, words or, or sentences that should be uh, linked to other pages on Wikipedia. How we do this is that I'm going to skip a lot of technical details is that it's, it is two step process. We first identify potential candidates of um, a potential links in the page. And then uh, we're going to build a classifier that identify the right page to be linked to that article text. For example, in this case, we have a sentence that says, prominent thinker of the Napoleonic school in Alexandria. Alexandria here, you don't want to link to Alexandria in Italy, you might want to link to Alexandria somewhere else, right? So, um, or Alexander in New South Wales, for example. So um, you, um, this is more or less how it works. Again, there's lots of months and months of research behind that. But then basically the output of this is a tool that given text can automatically create blue links. And this tool is embedded into a product or into a tool that in this case is used um, uh, to train or to engage new editors in uh, and to make them understand how wikipedia works and make them engaging engage with the platform what they see um in this tool when they open the tool is that they have uh, a wikipedia page and a suggestion of a potential uh, uh, word that should be turned to a blue link and um then they can accept or reject the suggestion they can give some feedback and then they can save the edit and by doing that Basically, they not only uh, learn how Wikipedia works, but they can also uh, improve the quality of Wikipedia articles and without the need of looking for um, individual uh, words that can be turned into links, right? Or and look for all potential candidates in the pay in the whole Wikipedia, et cetera. So second problem is, for example, another example, second problem. Um, Wikipedia is missing images, which breaks my heart. There are about 50% of Wikipedia articles that are without images. So what we do is that we build a model that given an article without an image automatically retrieves the set of uh, a set of candidate image that could be good match for that article. I'm going to skip the detail. I can tell you that this is a very, very difficult task that modern computer vision plus language techniques cannot easily solve. And actually, um, for the future, we, um, we want to improve the current models. So um, we open up a competition on Kaggle. It's actually, we already closed it by the way, by now, um, where we ask the scientific communities to gather around the problem of image text matching. And we gave lots of data from um, millions of images and, and hundreds of Wikipedias. And we got quite good participation. If you're interested in doing these kind of things, the competition and the data is already there or reach out to me and, and I'll tell you more about this competition. But it's just to tell you this is a very difficult problem. However, even without very advanced solutions, we were able to build a tool to retrieve good images for articles and, or a model. And then this model is embedded again in a tool um, for people to semi-automatically add images to article. So again, in this tool, people will see an image article match, they will accept it or reject it. If they accept it, they will be asked to write a caption and then the caption together with the image will be saved on the page. And again, by doing so, not only we um, add images to the article, we add more images to the article, but we also help editors not to have to look all the possible image in, on the web that could be a good match for a non-illustrated article. Um, 
I think I'm going to skip this one, unfortunately, because this is this was interesting, but I uh, probably need to start wrapping up and tell you a bit about our initiatives towards bridging contributors gap. Um, bridging contributors gap is uh, something that the Wikimedia Foundation as a whole is very invested in. As a research team, um, we are contributing to that. We have started contributing to that only relatively recently. So um, this is an area of research that is completely open for us. But really, there are several teams at the Wikimedia Foundation that are working on understanding the space of uh, contributors and trying to provide tools to bridge some of the huge gaps that we have. For example, our um, Global Data and Insights team is running a community insight survey to understand the extent to which the editor's population is uh, skewed geographically in this case, but also how many people we retain over the year um, and, and various characteristics. So if you're interested in these kind of um, insights, you, there's lots of information there and on our end what we do and what we hope to do more is to understand um, better community practices and understand what editors do when they come to our site so to this end we build a classifier this is really we just 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 built it that given an edit um, automatically understands what happened in the edit. So for example, if an image was added or a text was added, and the aim of this tool is down the line to be able to map uh, the editor behavior across different types of editors. So if we're able to analyze the distribution of edit types across different categories of editors, for example, geographic location or experience on the site, then we are able to um, come up with uh, uh, ideas about designing tools that can help editors throughout the editing process and also retain some editors, um, especially from some, some categories uh, down the line. So this, is, this work has just started and we have other, many ideas about other types of work that can inform this type of research. So again, if you have feedback, I'm happy to hear. Um, this beautiful plot, I don't have time to explain, but um, this is work done by my colleague Isaac about understanding the types of biases that we introduce when we introduce um, when we introduce tools and recommender system in the editor workflows. Basically, the message of this plot is that bias is there at any stage of the editing process and the recommendation process. We could by doing intervention on editors, enhance or reduce certain biases. So we need to be super careful about that. And you will hear more about this um, in the coming months. There is more research coming out of this. OK, um, I hope with this overview to have provided a, a understanding or at least an, an, um, somehow a picture of how research can help pre-knowledge communities such as the Wikimedia community. Um, one important thing is that emerges from all the research that we do is that the community is not made of silos. Um, when we think about the, the, the pillars or the dimensions of knowledge gaps, content readers and contributors, these are not separated readers becomes contributors, contributors produce content, which is read by readers. So these three components are heavily interdependent and more and more we need to be able to do research on the three fronts collectively. So what is next? Lots of things. Um, as I probably said, this is this, uh, throughout the presentation many times and we have lots of open questions uh, we need to be able to better define knowledge gaps that can be more inclusive in in of certain projects or certain realities that are very maybe far from the realities that we have in the research team we need to be able to measure better some of the gaps we are able now to measure four out of the 30 gaps in this in this wheel we need to 
be to do better um, at that and we need to do more research to understand for example how we met do we measure readability across languages um, and then we need more tools to bridge knowledge gaps each and every one of these knowledge gaps we hope to give some contribution to that we again had just scratched the surface and we are welcoming ideas from you on how to do that and if you have any feedback for us please reach out we're always happy to hear um, feedback and suggestions how to do a research and with that i this is all i have okay. thank you so much that was that was that was fantastic super super interesting um i mean i'm i'm you know to start out with i'm sure there's uh, there's folks have questions to ask but to just to start i'm, I'm curious you know um to you know the process you went through to identify the kind of knowledge gaps that you have that you're that you're representing in this um visualization but I, i'm i'm curious if there were any sort of contested or sort of unexpected sort of knowledge gaps you know like we're we're you know to what extent um you know, is a knowledge gap kind of an obvious thing or are there sort of these kinds of edge cases where you're not so sure if this is actually a knowledge gap or not? And yeah, so I'm just curious what you think. Yeah, no, this, is, this is very interesting. So actually what I condensed in that in that slide is a long process uh, that lasted one year to come up with the first um, um, version of the taxonomy. Then we put it out to the community Wikipedia community and, and sister project to uh, get feedback on the on on the set of initial gaps that we found and then we did a second iteration incorporated the feedback and this is the second version but it's in again in continuous evolution um so one of the so there, there are several gaps that we added and removed and we were thinking about one of the uh, interesting questions that we had was about what is a gap versus what is a barrier? So, um, or barrier, I don't know where the accent is, but um, for example, let's take technical skills. Technical skills could be considered a gap because we want representation with people with all different technical skills on the site, right? We want both editors and readers to be able to access their the size, no matter their, their, their advancement in technical skills. But at the same time, technical skills are also a barrier to entry. And so um, we needed to understand, in some cases, we removed some of the gaps that we initially put and we put them into barriers. For example, internet cost. Internet cost is a huge barrier to entry to, to Wikipedia because basically if the internet cost is high, you cannot even access the internet, so you're not going to access Wikipedia, right? Um, so this could be seen as a gap or it could be seen as a barrier. And we've, we had lots of discussion on this front. And I think we found the solution, but there is still, it's still fuzzy. So the next step here is that we want to be, I don't know if it's a four slice or a separate taxonomy about all the barriers that prevent people from, um, or that basically they are generating these gaps. Uh, so that we will have a clear idea of what se what separates gaps and and barriers. Mm, so the a gap, uh, sorry, a barrier is some kind of like externality, something that is not, you know, that keeps people from even having the possibility of participating. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Okay. Um, so there are some things that exclude people, and then there are some some aspects that are actually categories of people that are underrepresented hmm. and in some cases there is the, the you know difference is not so clear yeah the, the other question i have is about the sort of limits of this kind of language agnostic approach right you know like that to me seems like it i don't i, I don't know I, I would just be curious to what extent there's like the what do you push up against in terms of the limits of that yeah, this is a very good question. So I'm not a natural language processing person. I work with images that by default are language agnostic. So I am a big fan of images for that as well. Uh, what I can tell you is that um, most of the language agnostic models we've been developing 
uh, they ent entail language processing only in a very small part. So we tend to reason at, so you, I don't know if you know Wikidata. Wikidata is the a knowledge base that is behind Wikipedia. And that basically acts as a, it acts as a, as a base to pass from say the same article in one language in English Wikipedia to go to Italian Wikipedia and French Wikipedia and Spanish Wikipedia. So it's a kind of hub that help us reasoning at a multilingual level. So relying a lot on the connections that we have thanks to uh, Wikidata and basically connect entities and that exist in different languages into the, in the individual concept. Thanks to Wikidata, we are able to operate at a language level that is as wide as possible because we have representation of the same concept in different languages. Having said that, sometimes this is not possible, right? So there, there are ways, for example, at some point we build a model that even a sentence can automatically say whether the sentence needs a citation or not. And in that case, you really need to understand the structure of the language. And unless you have a way to understand the structure in 300 languages, you're not going to be language agnostic. You're going to be necessarily bound by the tools that can process the language. So we try to stay away to core language processing and reason at a knowledge graph level. So interesting. Um, yeah, no, the, the wiki data and the wiki commons, I've, I've recently been sort of sort of diving into that. We have, um, there's, there's some students that have been also lo looking, looking into both of those as well. Um, does, does, does anybody else, are, are there any other questions from, from, from anyone else here? Now's the time if you have a question. Yeah, I was going to ask a question. My mic was muted. <laughs> um, I was going to ask, I don't know if you touched over this and I just missed it, but does funding play a role in the research capabilities? Because I'm guessing you guys run ads and then I know you guys accept donations. Um, and does that play into anything? We don't run ads. So no, that, yeah. that is a good question. So we, um, the, we, Wikipedia doesn't have ads for many reasons, including that it can keep the neutrality. So the Wikimedia Foundation is entirely uh, financed by donations. Okay. And the research team at the Wikimedia Foundation is paid staff. Uh, we do receive grants, but it's generally paid staff. So we are all um, paid researchers, but we work a lot with um, collaborators from other universities. Mm. And in most of these cases, these collaborators are, are volunteers and we also um, have internships sometimes. So we, we sometimes we have different types of agreements with different collaborators. Uh, we recently opened a um, research fund initiatives to fund research works around uh, Wikimedia projects. Um, but yes, we are entirely based on donation. Is that oh. what that yeah, that, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. A any other questions from folks? Hi, Miriam. Um, thanks for the talk. It was really interesting to get this broad overview of all of the ways um, that you and your team are looking at these knowledge gaps and looking at um, you know this data. I'm really curious from from a modeling perspective, um, how you and your team um, work with the changing nature of Wikipedia data. So you mentioned like, you know, there's so many edits happening over time. And that to me says that the, the knowledge or that is there is changing. So I'm curious, like how your models address that, how they're updated over time. Yeah, this is a, a great question. Um, so, uh, there are two problems in working with evol evolving data. First is that we really have a 
tons of data. So it's not just the article, it's the whole history of the article. So if we want to find, for example, um, weak labels, or we want to find um, information that traces back to, I don't know, uh, 2001, we can, but it's it's really a lot of data. So in tech, we technically, you know, we operate on distributed systems to uh, be able to uh, deal with such amount, huge amount of data. In practice, um, the consumable data that we have is uh, producing monthly snapshots. So um, every month, the, snap, the data snapshot of all articles is updated. So uh, whenever we have models that uh, for example, need the update. For example, now uh, we are building a quality model to want automatically understand the quality of articles. If we want this model, once this model is in production and we want this model to be up to date with the latest um, um, edits, and we want to keep, you know, we want the model to be effective and to you know um, reflect the actual distribution of the current data we need to update it at, at least uh, once a month uh, with with the with the new data um, it's um it's super i have to say it's super interesting also to see when things don't work and why they don't work anymore right because sometimes there is a campaign somewhere uh, about i don't know adding new images of uh, women in science and then you see a spike in the statistics of the data and then you have to recalculate everything because uh, the you know the the landscape that you have depicted last month it doesn't exist anymore and it's super fascinating and it makes our life extremely complicated but we are happy to we are researchers so we're happy yeah yeah, yeah that makes a lot of sense. Do you like retrain the models every month from scratch or is it more of just like an update? So it is, you know, it really depends on, on the model. Um, if, um, if uh, we need to, up, in some cases, we just, we just need to fine tune it in a way that doesn't, you know, entail retraining a whole gigantic model. In some way, for a smaller model, we can retrain it completely, and um, and it, it, it it's fine. <laughs> we don't. It it really depends on what the model does and what the size of the model is. I'm going to stop recording, but we can continue to talk. <laughs>